Hey guys, Ms. Peterson here. And today we're going to be focusing in on QQT or quantitative qualitative translation style free response questions. This is one of the styles of free response questions that's going to be present on the 2020 AP exam. Um, so let's kind of dive into what these questions actually are. They always have three key parts to it. The qualitative part, okay? In this part of the question, it's gonna ask you to relate to quantities. It might ask you to agree or disagree with a presented explanation, but something that doesn't rely on any calculations or equations, something qualitatively that you can explain through concepts. Then it's gonna have a quantitative part. Sometimes you'll be actually plugging in numbers and collecting and um, writing down numbers in this part. Sometimes it'll just be deriving an equation, but it's really getting at that quantitative reasoning for the same concept. Um, and it's really important to have these two ideas separately because if you do one part, say the qualitative part with numbers, you might not get full points. They are two different types of skills, which then there's the translation part of it, quantitative, qualitative, translation. So some description of how these two explanations fit together and support each other to create one complete explanation. So we are going to dive on in. All of these questions that we go through are parts of released free response questions from past AP Physics 2 exams. Um, if I know the source, the source is right there for you. If I don't know the source, then it doesn't have it, but they can all be found online through um, the question bank on AP Classroom and things like that. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so let's look at this first question that is from the 2019 AP Physics 2 exam. And it has to do with circuits. So we have two circuits shown above that contain an ideal variable power supply. Okay, that's this VPS. Um, an ohmic resistor of resistor R. In circuit one, the ammeter has negligible, so no internal resistance. And in circuit two, the ammeter has significant internal resistance R, and it's ohmic, meaning that it increases linearly when the current increases. The potential difference of the power supply is varied and measurements of current and potential are recorded. So how will the current measured by the ammeter compare in the two circuits as the power supply voltage is increased? Sketch two possible graphs and explain why they have the shape they do. So this is the qualitative part. It's just basically what is this difference going to cause in the two circuits. So if we look at circuit one, okay, the only resistance in that circuit is R, where in circuit two, it has R plus R. So it has more internal resistance. So what does that mean for the current? Okay, first we need to know the relationship between voltage and current. Generally, as voltage increases, current increases with the same resistance. Um, this comes from V equals IR. That is the quantitative part of it, but we can use that here. So as voltage increases, current increases. So this one is gonna be our circuit one graph. Now, circuit two. Is that value of little r going to change the shape of the graph? No, okay, all it does is add increased resistance. It doesn't change it from a linear to a non-linear relationship. It just has more resistance, which means for a supplied power difference, for a supplied voltage, it's gonna be harder for the current to get through. So it's going to lower the current. So circuit two is going to have a lower um, current. So since, Explaining it qualitatively, since circuit two has more resistance, it will have less current for, oops, right a little bit neater there, for a given voltage. The relationship, relationship 
between current and voltage is linear. So I explained why circuit two has a lower slope, okay? Less slope and why they both are linear. So check, check on my qualitative explanation. So now let's go over to the quantitative. The quantitative says derive an equation in terms of delta VPS, I, R, and little r that satisfies conservation of energy for a circuit. Explain how this equation supports the qualitative description. Okay, so this part right here, that's the translation part. And deriving an equation, that's the quantitative part. So let's go ahead and do that first for circuit one and circuit two. Now, whenever you have to derive an equation, odds are it's an equation that you already know, okay? It's based on something from the equation sheet that you just need to reorganize. In this case, it's um, Ohm's law, which is the, the change in voltage equals current times resistance, okay? That is Ohm's law, it is the basics. It does satisfy conservation of energy because remember voltage is that change in potential energy per charge and that equals the current times the resistance, okay? That is there. Now, um, another way that you could kind of show this if you want to show the conservation a little clearer is that zero, there's no change when you take that voltage minus the current times resistance. Um, this is the voltage used by R. Okay, so that shows conservation of energy. Either one I think would get points on the AP exam. Now for circuit two, okay, circuit two has that other resistor. So the change in voltage of the power supply is going to be equal to the voltage used by R, same as the other one, and the current times little r. That's the voltage or the energy used up by the um, internal resistance, the ammeter here, okay? So if we reorganize this and clean it up, we could have, oops, change in the voltage of the power supply equals I times R plus R, okay? Showing that um, the equivalent resistance of the circuit is both the resistor and the internal resistance, or putting it in the form of the zero, ZPS minus I times R plus R, okay? Now, for the translation part, you can't forget about the translation part in these. I'm going to be doing the translation part in red for all of these problems. So let me switch my colors. So explain how this equation supports the qualitative description. Okay. First off, these are both linear equations. Okay. Linear equations. Now, if we write this in terms of this graph, okay, y equals mx, um, there's no intercept, it should be no voltage, no current, so we don't need to have the plus b. y is our current, m is our slope, I don't know what that is yet, times the voltage of the power supply. If we reorganize this equation to get it in that form, we end up with i equals 1 over R times VPS. So the slope is the inverse of the resistance, okay? Slope is the inverse of the resistance. So since circuit 2 has a higher resistance, okay, its slope would be 1 over R plus R, okay? Then it's going to have a lower slope since the slope is the inverse of that. So that is how the equations that we derived match up with the graphs, okay? Qualitative, quantitative, translation. Okay, cool? Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next one. 
Okay, next problem. This one has to do with fluids and I'm pretty sure it's from 2003. Um, so, a diver descends to the ocean floor at a depth of 35 meters below the surface. The density of the ocean water is 1.025 times 10 to the third kilogram meters per, ki per meter cubed. He finds a rectangular aluminum plate with dimensions 1 by 2 by 0 0.03 meters. Hoisting cable is lowered from the ship and the diver connects it to the plate. The density of aluminum is 2.7 times 10 to the third. Ignore the effects of viscosity. Okay. So in this one, um, this was a small part of the larger problem, and the quantitative was actually first. So it says, calculate the tension in the cable if it lifts, lifts the plate up at a slow constant velocity. So in this one, we are actually going to be plugging in numbers and doing some calculations. So let's start. So we have, oops, uh, that's not the color I want. Okay, we have our aluminum plate, okay? It is being lifted from the ocean floor, so we know it has a force of gravity on it. And it's asking us to calculate the tension in the table, cable that's lifting it. So we know that is one of those upward forces. I'm going to use FT for force of tension. Now we know there's also going to be a buoyancy force on this, okay? Force of buoyancy. Now, if it's going at a constant velocity, we know these forces are going to be balanced. So the force of gravity must equal the force of tension plus the force of buoyancy. Okay, all of those are going to be balanced. If we're calculating the tension, then it will be the force of gravity minus the force of buoyancy. We know we can calculate the force of gravity from mass times gravity minus the force of buoyancy, which is rho v g. Okay, now we have to be careful here on our rows. This is going to be the density of water, okay? Where we don't know the mass of our plate, okay? We know the density of the ocean water, we know the dimensions of our plate, and we know the density of the plate but we don't know off the top of our heads the um, mass of the plate. We're gonna have to figure that out. We know density is equal to mass over volume, okay? Where this will be the volume of the plate and the density of the aluminum. So if we're calculating the mass, it'll be rho, um, the density times the volume. So I'm putting it in here as if we were calculating an equation. Important thing to note though, for this mass, since this is the mass of aluminum, it'll be the density of aluminum times the volume of the plate. Okay, minus the density of water, volume of the plate, times G. So, basically, we have the volume of the plate times gravity times the difference in those two densities. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in numbers then. Okay, go over here, so force of tension is the volume, which is 1 times 2 times 0 0.03 meters cubed, okay, times gravity. This is a free response problem, so I'm going to use 9.81 meters per second squared times the difference in those two densities. So the density of aluminum, I have to go back and check that, is 2.7 times 10 to the third and then water is 1.025. So 2.7 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter minus 1.025 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, we can see how the units work out. The meters cubed cancel each other out and we're left with kilogram meters per second squared, AKA Newtons. And we just plug that all into our calculator, okay? 1 times 2 times 0 0.03 times 9.81 um, times 2.7 times 10 to the third minus 1.025 times 10 to the third. And we get 985.9, okay? Most of these numbers only had two sig figs, so I'm just going to say about 990 newtons. So about 1,000 newtons, okay, is the force of tension in 
this system. Okay, now that's our quantitative. Let's look at our qualitative. Will the tension in the cable increase, decrease, or remain the same if the plate accelerates upward at 0 0.05 meters per second? Okay, so this is asking us to take our quantitative and be like, hey, if we wanted an acceleration, what effect would that have on the net force? So if we wanted an acceleration, we would need to have the net force not be equal to zero, which would mean that the force of tension would need to be greater than the force of gravity minus the force of buoyancy. Okay, but if you want to accelerate upward at a constant velocity, okay, you still need a constant force. But that force, okay, well, these ones are fixed. So gravity and buoyant forces are fixed. So to cause and acceleration, we would need a stronger or a bigger, you could say, a bigger tension force. Okay, a bigger force due to tension. However, it would still be constant. Okay, basically, the tension would need to increase. Tension. Should increase. Okay. There we go. We got the quantitative, the qualitative, and because we were comparing it directly in the qualitative, we have the translation. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay. So now we have a problem from thermodynamics. Uh, we got a PV diagram here and a sample of an ideal gas in a thermally insulated container. Okay, thermally insulated container with a movable piston is initially at state A. Okay, and it goes from state A to state B by an adiabatic process. The dashed lines represent isotherms. Okay, so let's start with our qualitative. Okay. Let W be the work done, Q be the energy transferred, and delta U be the change in internal energy. And now this part, though we are talking about numbers, it's really just about is it positive, negative, or zero for all of these. So let's start with W, the work. Well, it's moving left on a graph, okay? It is compressing. Also, if you remember, uh, work is the area under the curve on the graph. So all of those make it so that the work is positive, okay? It is, work is greater than zero, okay? Work is done on the gas, compressing it to a smaller volume, okay? Remember, by convention on AP Physics 2, work is described as positive when work is done on the gas, not by the gas. So the gas is compressing, work is being done on it, so that is a positive work, okay? Putting in energy. Q. This one, Q, is equal to zero. The key term here is adiabatic. So adiabatic means no transfer of heat. That is the definition of adiabatic. Your other hint here was that it said that it was thermally insulated. Thermally insulated. Since Q is heat, the energy transferred by heating, if no heat can get in and out, then we have an adiabatic process, okay? No transfer. Now, delta U is internal energy. Okay. There's a couple different ways we can reason this one out. First, it's moving up on the isotherm lines. If you remember, as you move up in the graph, okay, as you move in this direction, the temperature increases. So delta U is going to be greater than zero. Also, if the work is positive and Q is zero, 
we know that the internal energy is the work plus the heat. So it must also be positive. Okay, so the it moved out to a higher isotherm. That can be one. Um, you could also say that the work is positive. So the delta U is going to equal the work done since the Q is zero. Okay, either of those work. Um, another way you could remember it is that if you go back to PV equals NRT, these are going to be constants. So the temperature is proportional to PV. Okay, and that's going to be important when we get to the quantitative part. Because in the quantitative part of this, it says if the temperature of the gas at state A, okay, so the temperature at state A is 200 K, what is the proximate temperature of the gas at state B? Okay, so from Permnert and RT, okay, this is actually the combined gas law if you've taken chemistry, okay, we know that n and r are going to stay the same. So PV over T should be the same at state A as it is at state B. We're basically setting up a proportionality here. Okay, So we're going to need those pressures and volumes at those points. So the pressure at point A, the volume at point A, Pressure at A is 1 times 10 to the 5th, and volume is 1. Okay, so 1 times 10 to the 5th pascals, 1 times 10 to the 3rd meters cubed. All of our units check out. Uh, let's look at the pressure at state B. So at state B, the pressure... It looks like it's a little bit closer to 6 than it is to 5, okay? It says approximate, approximate, and say 5.7, okay? 5.7 times 10 to the 5th pascals, the volume at state B, okay? Volume is, looks like it's, let me fix that. Okay, almost in the middle, maybe closer to 0.25. So let's say point, let's see, 0 0.25, this would be 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, 0.45. Okay, I think we'd be pretty safe if we say 0.35. Let's go with that. Okay, 0 0.35 times 10 to the third Pascals. Okay. So then we can use this ratio we set up. Temperature at state B should be approximately equal, oopsie, this should be A, okay, to PA, VA over TA, okay, and then, wait, I messed up here. Fix my ratio, do better algebra. Temperature at state B should be approximately equal to PB, VB, times the inverse of that. So temperature at state A times divided by PA, VA. Right? Is that better algebra? Zoop. Zoop. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> okay, and so then let me just go ahead and plug in the values into my calculator. We can simplify these values, okay? The pressure volume, these 10 to the fifths and 10 to the thirds will cancel out. That makes things a little bit easier. Um, so we have the pressure at state B, 5.7 pascals times the volume. I'm not even gonna put the units just to save room here. 0.35, we're just doing approximations. Temperature A, 200, okay? divided by, hey, look, it's one times one. So we just have those there. So 5.7 times 0.35 is about two times 200. 
So I got 399, so about 400 Kelvin. Okay, now the translation. Explain how your numerical result is consistent with the change in the internal energy. Okay, so temperature B is approximately 400 K, meaning the temperature, which is proportional to the internal energy, went up. Okay, which is expected by the delta U equals Q plus W and the PV explanation or the isotherm explanation, okay? Whichever explanation you used, it is consistent. Again, that seems like you're just repeating yourself, but it's really important to get those translations, explanations in there, especially when it says it explicitly, okay? Make sure you explain that. Okay, next problem on electromagnetism. This one is from the 2015 AP exam. We have a particle with an unknown mass and charge projected into the apparatus shown above. Um, a particle moves at a constant speed v as it passes undeflected through a pair of parallel plates as shown above. The plates are separated by a distance d, constant potential v, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's go ahead and get to the problem. Uh, this is the basic setup of a mass spectrometer, which scientists use to figure out the mass of particles that things are made of. So explain why the particle moves through the parallel plates undeflected in terms of the force exerted on the particle. Okay, so it's in a magnetic field and it's going between two parallel plates. So we know it's gonna have a magnetic force on it and an electric force, okay? So the particle has both a particle experiences both a magnetic and electric force. Okay. Now this does require us to know a little bit about these forces. Um, these forces must be balanced in an opposite directions. Now the electric force depends on the charge of the particle and the potential difference between those plates. And the magnetic force depends on the charge of the particle, the speed of the particle in the magnetic field. So since I'm gonna say this one, force magnetic, not singe, since the force magnetic depends on velocity while the electric force does not, at certain speeds, these two will be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, allowing the vertical forces on the particle to be balanced and it passed through and deflected. Okay. Basically, if we have the particle, um, if we're looking at this particle, we would need a little bit more information to figure out the sign of the particle. It's another part of this problem. Uh, basically, we would use the fact that when it enters, the magnetic force is in the downward direction. Why? Oh, force do the, not buoyancy force, the magnetic force. Okay, so we would use our right hand, okay, and check if it's velocity. I use thumb for velocity. The magnetic field is going into the page. So the magnetic force on it would be 
up if it were positive, but it's down, so the particle's negative, okay? So when it goes through that field, okay, if its velocity is out and magnetic field is into the page, it's negative, so we flip the force. The magnetic force is going to be down, which means the electric force will be up, which makes sense because as it's drawn, this is our negative plate and this is our positive plate. So the negative particle would be attracted to the positive and have that force upward, causing that balance of the forces. Okay, now for the quantitative. A magnetic field of 0 0.30 teslas is applied to the plates with a separation. Um, I think plate separation and magnetism is actually R, not D. Plate separation R of 5.0 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. Singly ionized particles with various speeds enter the region and only those with a speed of 2.0 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Okay, that's that velocity selector I was talking about, how only at certain velocities those forces will be balanced. Okay, uh, they then reach the collector plate a distance of 0.42 meters below where they left. Based on your explanation in part A, there's the translation, derive an algebraic expression for the potential difference that must be applied. So I said those forces need to be equal. So the magnetic force must equal the electric force, okay? So we need to derive that and then use it to calculate the numerical value of that potential difference. Well, magnetic we know is QVB and the force electric is Q times E. We don't know the strength of the electric field, but we can sub in the equation for the voltage in the electric field, which is delta V over delta R, the plate separation, okay? That's one of the equations for the um, constant electric field for parallel plates of like a capacitor. So we can see that the Q cancels out, the charge doesn't matter. We're solving for delta V, so if I reorganize, we get delta V equals the velocity times the magnetic field strength times the plate distance separation. So basically the three numbers that we have in our column there, multiply them all together. and we get 3,000 volts. So that must be the potential difference between the plates. Okay. Um, and basically in this, the translation was using the concept of the magnetic force equaling the electric and that they will be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Okay, so that's where the translation part comes in here. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay, so now we're looking at an electrostatics problem. So we have two insulating spheres that are mounted on rigid pivots that can rotate. Okay. Suspended near a surface, suspended vertically, blah, 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 stiff rods. Spheres are initially far apart. The pivots are locked so that they can remain vertical while they're moved to figure two. And then they are allowed to rotate and they rotate until they get to the separation in figure three. The pivots are always on the same height. For both the qualitative and the quantitative, consider a system that only includes the two spheres with Earth external to the system. Now that is an interesting concept. What that means is that we are ignoring gravity, okay? If Earth is external to the system, we are not considering gravity, we are not considering gravitational potential energy. And that's gonna be important as we look at the next problems, okay? Start with write an expression for the work done moving the spheres horizontally from far apart to a separation of R2. Okay, so for that first step, um, express, express your answers in terms of Q naught, R2, and physical constants as appropriate. Okay, so there's a couple different ways we can think about it. We can think of the work being done as the change in electrical potential energy, or we can think of the work being done as the electric force times Q, or times <laughs> the distance, okay? 
both of these will get us to the same answer. Um, I'm going to start from the definition of work with the force electric times the distance because that equation is one I'm a little bit more familiar with. Um, and we know that when they are far apart, they exert no electric force. So the work will just be done from the electric force that they exist when they're at that distance. So the force electric equation is K, it says Q naught, they both have charge Q naught, so we have Q naught Q naught over that distance, which will be R2 squared times the distance, okay? And the distance that they get moved to is R2, okay? That's where it's gonna have its max amount of energy. You could think of it as moving from that distance to like really far apart, okay? Things like that. So that cancels out with that, and we're left with that the work is K times Q naught squared over R2. And you might notice that that equation is super similar to the equation for electrical potential energy. Okay, the electrical potential energy at some distance um, far out would be basically zero. So for the work done, it would be the final position where electrical potential is, let me just show you the equation sheet. Okay. There we go. Okay, where the electrical potential energy is Q times delta V, and delta V is KQ over R. So it still comes out to K times the charge squared divided by the distance. Okay, so I will show you that way. Okay. That would be Q times that voltage. So Q naught times K Q naught over R2. And it works out to the same equation. Okay. So now let's look at the qualitative part of this. Okay, the total energy of the two sphere systems with Earth's still external changes as the system goes from the configuration in figure two to the configuration in figure three. Explain how the energy changes in terms of the system. Okay, so this one is going a little bit farther. This one is one where that quantitative qualitative isn't on the exact same process, but it is on the same system, so we should still be able to make some relationships there. Okay, basically from figure two to figure three, Okay, how does the energy change? A couple different ways you can think about this. Our default might be to say, oh, well, they're raising up, so they're gaining gravitational potential energy. But remember, we're considering Earth external to the system. So we can't talk about gravity. We have to talk about the electrical potential energy. Here, we said they started with zero electrical potential when they were far apart, and that increased as they got brought closer. Well, from figure two to three, they are separating. So basically, the electrical potential energy of the system decreases, okay? The energy of the system decreases as it moves from figure two to figure three, okay? With it locked, okay, in figure two, okay, it, the particles are closer together. The charges are closer together. So there is more electrical potential energy. Okay. There's more electrical potential energy. When it translates from figure two to pick figure three, that, I'm just gonna say EP, that electrical potential energy does work to move the charges. Okay, it does work to cause them to move out, spread away from each other, thus decreasing the energy of the system.
Okay. So if we're looking at this whole thing, uh, first they were really far apart. Okay. They had no electrical pull energy. External work was done to bring them closer. That's what we are doing over here in the quantitative part, figuring out that amount of work. Now for the third one, the qualitative part, it's kind of the opposite of that. That electrical potential energy is doing work to spread them out. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay, last problem in the set. Then this one, we're also looking at circuits. This is one of the styles of problems where we are also deriving an equation and seeing if we agree or disagree with a student um, and how our equation supports that. So students have a battery of negligible internal resistance and identical resistive heating elements with the resistance R that they want to use to heat water. Uh, first, the students consider connecting them in series. One student says to heat the water faster, they should use as many heating elements as possible connected in series. Now, in each of these ones, uh, the equation part or the quantitative part was presented first, so let's start there. It says, derive an equation for the power dissipated by a circuit containing n heating elements in series in terms of E, R, N, and physical constants as appropriate. So, our go-to power equation is current times voltage, but it's wanting us to use E, so let's use E. Current times voltage. Now, we want it in terms of the resistance, okay? So if we look at Ohm's law, V equals IR, we can represent current in terms of the voltage. It would be E, which is the V, over R. So our power equation then becomes the EMF squared over that resistance, okay? But that's based on one heating element, okay? If we have n heating elements, there are a couple ways we can look at this, okay? First off, when things are connected in series, the voltage has to get shared among them all, okay? So it's not going to be E. It is going to be E over n. And if we wanted the power, Okay, we would be adding up the power from each individual resistor. So we're going to have to take our whole thing and multiply it by n number of heating elements. Okay, however many heating elements you have, multiply it, add them together, that's what you get. So if we put that into our equation, we have the voltage divided by n over that resistance times this n. Oh, and this is squared in the equation. So one of those ends is gonna cancel out. And so we end up with E squared over N times R, okay? So the voltage squared divided by N times R. There are other ways you could have done this. You could have known that the equivalent resistance is N times R, okay? That probably would have been an easier way to get to the equation. Um, but yeah, both of them work. Okay, <laughs> so based on this equation here, do we agree with the student's claim? Okay, no. Okay. We know in series, no, I do not agree. When the elements are connected in series, it increases the total resistance of the circuit, which decreases current. And the voltage must get shared both of those factors the current and the voltage both decrease the total sorry right my those messies the total power of the circuit okay and then 
they want the translation. Does this equation support or refute the student's claim? So if we look at the equation, power equals E squared over NR, okay? So we can see that the power has an inverse, inversely related to number of resistors. So as N increases, power decreases, okay? That's the translation. The, the equation that we derived does not support the student's agreement about the time it takes to heat the water. So then there's a second part to this one, another qualitative quantitative translation. Okay, another student suggests that heating the elements in parallel might be a better idea. So if we have our EMF, okay, and then heating the elements in parallel might be a better idea. Okay, so that will heat them faster than the same number because the current in the parallel circuit will be less. Okay, that might be your first clue. Wait a minute. The current would be less? No, as you add resistors in parallel, the current actually increases, okay? But we'll get to that. So let's go ahead and write our equation again. We have the same base, okay? Power, oops, I want to be in blue. Power equals I current times voltage, okay? But again, we can rewrite the current in terms of the EMF, E squared over R. Now, in parallel, okay, as you add them, the voltage stays the same and the resistance actually decreases, okay? So, the total resistance then would actually be one well, we know it's 1 over R equals 1 over R plus 1 over R, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So when we do this, okay, the current's going to stay the same. That's going to stay the same. So the resistance stays the same. The voltage stays the same because they're in parallel. So to get it, we should just multiply it by the number of heating elements we have neither the voltage nor the resistance will change. So our equation is simply E squared times N over R. No, the N is in a different place. This time there's a direct relationship between power and current. So since power equals the current squared times N over R, there is a direct relationship between N and R, or N and P. So as the power, as the number of resistors increases, the power increases. So we agree with the student's claim, okay? Agree. As the number of resistors increases, the power also increases, and that is supported by the equation. However, the current will increase as well, not decrease as the student claimed. So recognizing that although their claim was correct, okay, that it will heat the water faster, their reasoning was not quite correct. Um, the reason is because the voltage stays the same and it actually draws more current from the uh, power supply from the EMF than, um, than it did in series, okay? So hopefully that helped you guys with the qualitative quantitative translation style of problem and isolating out those skills. 
Um, hope this helps.